Right, good afternoon. And welcome to the opening of the Jack Welch College of Business Finance Center. And this very special conversation that will mark that opening. Now, to start things off, I want to introduce Mr. Richard Schaefer, who will then introduce our guest of honor. Now, in addition to being a highly valued member of the, of the Sacred Heart Board of Trustees, Richie also heads up Liquid Groups Holdings, Special Advisor to General Atlantic. He previously served as Director, Secretary, Vice Chairman, and Chairman of the New York Mercantile Exchange and on the board of the Robert H. Smith School of Business at the University of Maryland, of which he's a graduate. In addition, he is a board member of the Museum of American Finance. He's also active with the New York chapter of the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation. But most of all, Richie is a great, great friend of Sacred Heart and the Welsh College of Business. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Richard Schaefer. John, uh, by the way, that University of Maryland stuff, it doesn't count anymore, so <laughs> it's all sacred heart. Well, welcome everybody. Welcome, thank you, Goldman Sachs, for spending the day with us today and helping our kids, helping mentor the kids here at school and educating them in how to go from <laughs> undergraduate to the real business world with um, Gary Cohen's team and Bevan and Jeff, and uh, you've been just wonderful. And we, Greatly, greatly appreciate it. Uh, I'd like you to welcome a couple of our board members, Jim Morley and Dan McCartney are here today. Uh, they're here because they support the students, they support the school, and they've been great advocates for all you kids. And I encourage you during our cocktail session to talk to everybody but me. No, to, to reach out and anything we can do will be helpful. Today is a special day. It's a special day for a few reasons. Number one, we have this beautiful new finance center, beautiful new Jack Welsh building, which is really important. Um, just over the last, our school was founded, what, about 35 years ago? 50 years ago, 60 something. And to build to such a great institution in such a short time is really an amazing feat. The business school itself is wonderful. John does an amazing job as the dean. and. Needless to say, all of that comes from somewhere or supervision from someplace. And I'd like to spend just a minute or so to talk about our president, uh, not that one, the real president, <laughs> the real president, John Fratello. John and I got to be great friends just about a year and a half ago or so. Uh, we had met through mutual friends. He had invited me to speak to some of the honor students. Uh, in the business school and I came and I spoke and our relationship grew and he asked me to sit on the board of directors, which was my pleasure to be among so many prestigious people. From there he asked me to oversee the endowment, the investment committee, and it was my pleasure and please stop asking. <laughs> but it's my, it's my pleasure. I love the school, the board is great, the students are great, and whatever I can do to help is my absolute pleasure. These two gentlemen sitting here today have a lot in common, although you wouldn't know it on the surface and neither do they know it. They're both the preeminent people in their professions. John Patillo has built a school uh, that's amazing. Our rankings in every category have gone up. He tells me today we're just ranked 24th in the nation in gaming, something that didn't even exist when I was graduating college. And the staff, the team that John has put together, uh, Bobby Valentine, where's Bobby Valentine? Bobby Valentine is not only a great friend of the university, not only our athletic director, but a great supporter of our whole board, our whole team, has gone out of his way to introduce us to people who have allowed buildings like this to be built and have helped us to build an endowment which is very substantial for the size university we are and very substantial for any university. And that's gonna keep growing. I say they have a lot in common even though they're different. John is preeminent educator. He's a preeminent leader in the field. 
uh, and Gary Cohn, uh, who, by the way, I know Gary Cohn for, we're not that old, but about 35 years. Um, I know Gary since my early, early days in the New York Mercantile Exchange. Gary has been a mentor of mine, a supporter of businesses that I've been involved in, particularly the New York Mercantile Exchange. And just an amazing human being. And what he has done, he being here today is very special for me. He's a friend, he's a good friend. You can imagine how many heads of states, uh, presidents, chairmen of countries, <laughs> companies that all want to have his time. So him giving us time today is our, what I'll call our team of two that's going to be kind of like our, um, our panel. Uh, but he is our keynote speaker, but it's really going to be a panel between the two of them. But what really makes these guys the same, what really, when I said we have two different people that are the same, is what each one of you students are going to learn. Hopefully you've learned it, hopefully you're in the process of learning, and that's giving back. There's nothing more important than giving back. Your professions will change, they'll be different. You'll like some, you won't like some, you'll end up in a great place but giving back, serving on boards, giving back to kids. Uh, a gentleman in Goldman Sachs, who's not here today, was telling me a story about Gary Cohn being, each one of the people at Goldman have to do a certain amount of charitable work. Let's say they wanna do a certain amount of charitable work, and they do, but it comes from the top. And this employee of Goldman is telling me one of their projects was building homes for those less fortunate. And the guy who worked the hardest, and carried the most stuff, and did the most in that project was Gary Cohn. To me, that giving back for both John and Gary is what sets people apart. Yes, Gary is the preeminent guy in Wall Street, including everyone in his company and every other company. He's a great friend, he's a mentor to me, and he gives back a lot. John similarly gives back, he's a great friend, so I put them in the same category as leaders, the top leaders within their own segment. And to both you and to Gary, a special thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rich. It's working. <laughs> <laughs> and Gary, thank you so much for being today and for having your team here with our students earlier. Uh, I know they've learned a lot and they've benefited by it. We, Gary and I had a very brief chat yesterday uh, in preparation for him coming here today, but we'll get into some of those things later. But Gary, if you would, you've been at Goldman almost 25 years. You've had a variety of positions and jobs. Were there points in that, those experiences that prepared you for the next level or, what, or any one or two that had such an impact on you uh, for leadership skills? First, before I um, answer that, it's a great question. Let me thank you all for being here. I know that you all have busy afternoons. Let me thank Richie for the great introduction, the trustees, the faculty, the students. I appreciate you being here this afternoon, putting ties on. I don't know why, but I know, I know that was the hardest thing you did today. I also you know, want to thank um, the Goldman Sachs team for coming, doing community teamworks here today, working with you for those that you participated. I hope you got a lot out of it. I know my team got a lot out of working with you, so I, I want to thank you all for that. And uh, you know, hopefully, this is the start of a, um, a, a you know long project that we can do together. Um, when you talk about leadership and learning episodes that make you a better leader, I don't know if there's one or two. I can always say there's one or two things that made me better. But I think the great leaders are really people that are learning every day of their life. Um, and, and I've always thought of myself as someone that's willing to learn every day of my life. And more importantly, and I've said this and people laugh when I say it, I'm really good at making mistakes. And you have to be good at making mistakes. If you want to thrive in life, um, you have to be willing to try. You have to be willing to push a little bit, and you have to be willing to make mistakes. But don't make the same mistake twice. And I think where you get your leadership skills is pushing the edge, pushing the envelope, falling flat on your face, picking yourself up and saying, OK, I got it. I'm not going to do that again. And, and so I think that 
skill is more important than an incident here or an incident there or an incident there. I can tell you about some of those incidents, but the, the overall living your life leadership skill to me is much more important. Following up on something you said, when does risk become risky? Risk becomes risky when you don't understand the feedback you're getting. So when you keep doing something and it fails, the first time you did it, it was just risk. The second time, it was riskier. And the third time, it was risk. Because if you weren't succeeding, you weren't understanding what the world was trying to tell you. So Richie and I both grew up in the trading world. Um, you know, in those old movies you see, Rich, I hate to say it, but they're old movies. Those old movies you see, where guys used to stand around pushing, shove, and screaming at each other and trade, that's what Richie and I did. Um, and I used to say, my most successful trades always started out as losing. Because you'd go put a trade on, and you were sure you were right when you did it, or else you wouldn't do it. You never started out to lose money. But then you started out thinking you were completely right. The market gave you feedback, and your P&L gave you real feedback since you were losing your own money. And all of a sudden, you were forced to dynamically change your mindset, and you change what you were doing. And the ability to acknowledge that you were wrong relatively quickly was the difference between failing and succeeding. So you know when they tell you that 99% of the people that trade commodities lose money, they're right. Because 99% of the people aren't willing to admit they just made a mistake and go the other direction. And so I think that's when risk becomes risky, is when you keep getting the same feedback and not acknowledging what the feedback is. So the learning curve needs to take, take yeah, effect. Yeah, the learning curve, the acknowledgement, not being stubborn, being realistic, hearing the other side of an equation. Mm -hmm. You know, there's, there's lots of different ways we could talk sure. about when risk becomes risky. Well, following the, along that grain, um, since 08, and the, just regulation has changed in the world. Um, if it's any consolation, which it may not be, not only the financial industry, higher ed is over-regulated to the nth degree, and so I think across uh, industries, but certainly that has affected your industry too, and um, maybe affected the notion of risk, but how has the, the new rules or regulations affected your business, and do these new rules and regulations really prevent or remove the risk that people are worried about? How long do you have? You got it. <laughs> I'm sure you could go on in education the rest of the day. Um, but I do have a suggestion. I have a suggestion that you start going down to Congress and explaining that to them. Maybe they'll be more receptive to you than they are to me. I seem to be in Washington every week trying to explain to them the unintended consequences of overregulation. Uh, so, so look, I can answer that question yes and no. And, and, and on the yes side, I'll go to the yes side first. In the pure micro world of are banks safer today? Unequivocally, banks are safer today than they were pre-08. And, and I say that on a factual basis, and I can give you lots of data. And I'll take my firm for an example. In, since 2008, we have doubled our equity capital footing. So we now have equity capital footings I don't know, it depends where the stock price is today. I'll give you 72 to $75 billion of equity capital. We today have a balance sheet of about $835 billion. We've doubled the equity, and our balance sheet has come from a trillion two to 835. So you can figure it out, simple math. Our leverage ratio has come from 30 times leverage to 11, 12 times leverage. Someone's doing the math to see if I'm right. I'm pretty close. So our leverage has come down dramatically. At the same time, our cash, the amount of cash we keep literally in treasury bonds in a bank account at night every night has gone up from about $60 billion a night. The last night it was right around $180 billion, plus or minus $3 billion. Who cares? $3 billion. Um, so $180 billion. So if you think of it in the pure terms, 
of are we more secure than we were? Absolutely, we're more secure. Um, but if you think about what that means to the global economy, all we have done is shifted the risks to another place in the economy. I, in some respects, look at this as like you know, the old adage of the tube of toothpaste. If you squeeze it here, it goes over here. You squeeze it here, it comes over here. You haven't eliminated the problem. The biggest problem that you've created is it used to be that banks were the transmission mechanism for the global economy. And what I meant by that is you had the Federal Reserve over here, and you had consumers or households over here. The Federal Reserve would decide to get the economy growing, prime the pump, get people spending, get people investing. They would loosen up monetary supply. They would add money in the system. They would do that by giving it to the banks. The banks then would, in turn, on lend that into their customers, which would be you know, homeowners, credit card owners, uh, automobile owners, small and medium-sized businesses, and we'd stimulate economic growth. That was the old world paradigm pre-08. It worked pretty well. What they did in the regulation in Dodd-Frank and Volcker is they said, OK, we're going to regulate the, transmission, the transmitter in the middle. We're going to highly regulate you. And so now when the Federal Reserve tries to introduce more liquidity in the system to grow the economy, which they've been doing for the last four years, simultaneously they're telling the transmitter, you need to hold more capital. You need to be safer. You need to be more secure. So we're giving you money over here, and instead of us lending it out over here and growing the economy, we just hoard it. We hoard it. We build capital. We build cash reserves. So all the things I told you about in the beginning, we're doing, but we're doing it because our regulators want us to, but at the expense of growing the US economy. So when you see Federal Reserve governors or you see senators saying, we don't understand. The Federal Reserve Bank has been pumping the economy full of liquidity, and we've had the easiest monetary policy we've ever had in the world, and we have a zero interest rate policy. Why isn't the US economy growing? It's pretty simple. They broke the complete transmission mechanism that allows the pipe that connects the Federal Reserve to Main Street America. Well, from, from that look at the, you started with the micro, from that look at the macro, are there opportunities then in this, or is it just hit and miss? Oh, it's, it's not hit or miss at all. I mean, they, they could, they, the royal they, um, they actually has a name, but I won't name him. Um, I just limited half the population to him. Um, <laughs> they could very easily change a couple of the benchmarks by which they gauge the solvency of a financial institution today. We have all these new fancy mechanisms which we have to abide by. They all end in R. And that's important that they all end in R. Because they end in R because they're all ratios. To get a ratio, you divide one number by another number. Numerator by denominator. The denominator in all these ratios is my balance sheet. So in order to provide the capital to Main Street, my balance sheet would have to get bigger. Every time I, I create a loan, my balance sheet gets bigger. Every time I extend credit, my balance sheet gets bigger. So I don't do that. Because I have to divide a bigger number into a smaller number, my ratio gets bigger. So anything that they would do, that it would allow my ratio to not expand or allow them to expand the levels that my ratio could work, would be helpful. These are things called, if you're reading the Wall Street Journal or you're reading the New York Times, you hear it. Something called like the net stable funding ratio, liquidity leverage ratio, CCAR, which is basically our annual stress test. I could go on and list a bunch of things that end in R, but those are sort of the three big ratios where you're basically saying that we don't want you to grow your balance sheet. In fact, we want you to shrink. We want you to get smaller. And there is this general view in Congress, really in the Senate more than even in the House, that smaller banks are better banks. Following up on other earlier part of your response, the rates being zero, do you think the Fed should or would raise the rates? And if they do, what would the implications be for us and other uh, parts of the world? So this is a 
very, very tricky question. The Fed's in the middle of their two-day meeting right now. We'll get an um, announcement tomorrow. So you, you said, should they raise rates? I don't think they should. But that's an easy answer for a mm -hmm. really difficult question. Um, I'll try and do this quickly. Janet Yellen, is a, Janet Yellen, chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank, is in a horrible, horrible position. She inherited a horrible position. Why did she inherit a horrible position? Because she comes in as chairperson of the Federal Reserve Bank at zero interest rates. Meaning, she can only really do one thing. She walks into her Federal Reserve Board meetings and says, okay, what can we do? Well, normally we can lower rates or we can raise rates. Rates are zero. Guess we can't lower rates. So we can do nothing or we can raise rates. She's in this horrible position where she would love to have the optionality if things got bad to lower rates. The only way she can lower rates is somehow raise them first so she's got some latitude to lower. So she fundamentally and desperately and emotionally wants to raise rates because she is paranoid and there's some legitimacy to her paranoia that the US economy could turn down and she's got no ammunition to fight a, turn, a, a, a declining US economy. So she wants to create the ammunition by getting rates higher so she could potentially lower them. So that's her, her fundamental viewpoint. The problem is the Fed has a dual mandate. They have a mandate to create jobs in this country and they have a mandate to fight inflation. On the job side, you could argue, I would take the other side, just so you know, I'll show you my hand quickly, you could argue that the Fed has done a good job or the economy has done a good job at creating jobs. We have a published unemployment rate of 5.5%, which is below sort of where they need to be on a benchmark standpoint. I would argue that that's a very, very fictitious rate. It's only that low because the participation rate has gone downward to 62.7% participation rate, which is at basically at the all-time lowest level. The participation rate really measures people out in the US population that are looking for jobs. There's so many people that have gotten frustrated looking for jobs that they just stopped. If the participation rate normalized, this is, a, this is a fun fact, if it normalized the day one of the Obama administration, we'd still be at 11% plus unemployment rate in the United States. So you know what we've done here is we've classified a lot of people as disabled, and we've discouraged a lot of people from looking. But, she could argue that the unemployment rate is 5.5%, and she would be legitimate in that. Her second half of her dual mandate, she's got a much, much bigger problem, which is really to be an inflation fighter. Every central bank is an inflation fighter. She really has no legitimate argument to raise rates without inflation being close to or having some inkling that it's approaching 2%. There's nothing out there whether it's CPI, PPI, any of the inflation data, any of the indicators out there really get you to a 2% inflation rate in the United States. And if anything, no one feels like there's much pressure on the inflation rate. And global inflation rates are negative in some parts of the world. And inflation is somewhat of a worldly phenomenon. Clearly, commodity prices are keeping inflation lower. Labor prices are keeping inflation lower. Global labor prices matter. We've come to a world where we've got fungible labor around the world. So in her dual mandate, she's in a very tough position. So in a long-winded answer to a very simple question, she'll, she wants to raise rates. She's going to continue to tell you she wants to raise rates, I believe. I think they're going to continue to tell you it's at the next meeting. And I think they're going to continue to kick this can down the road. Taking that stance then, what does it do for the rest of the world's economy then? Well, in many steps, if we raised interest rates, we'd be completely out of step with the rest of the world. You've got negative interest rates in Europe right now. Another fun fact, but it's another one of these. Every fact's a fun fact because, of course, there's half truths in every fun fact. 80% of the government bond market in Europe trades with a negative yield. Fun fact, because it's heavily weighted by overnight repo. It all trades at negative rates. So of course, 80% of the market trades at negative rates. But you know, even in Germany, we have negative rates out to seven years, six, six or seven years. I didn't look at where the curve is today. There's not a spot in the European interest rate curve. Go out as long as you want. 
that trades through 100 basis points. It's all sub 85 basis points. So you think of the rest of the world has low interest rates, lower than the United States. You know, we have, we have 10 year rates that we're approaching 2% today or 195, 197 today. Um, you know, Germany has 10 year rates at um, 15 basis points. Japan, you know, in the mid 40 basis points, 60 basis points. I, I actually didn't look where they are today. And the US still close to 2%. So our rates are already substantially higher than global rates. One of the reasons we have a strong dollar is because people, you know, if you want to get a risk-free rate of return higher than anywhere else in the world, you buy dollars and buy U.S. bonds. So in some steps, we, we, in some respect, we'd be totally out of sync with the rest of the world. And in fact, Europe has just started on a prolonged quantitative easing plan. They announced 1.1 trillion euros, 60, 60 billion a month, we're in the second month, so we're basically week six of their quantitative easing. Now, they did put limits on how far they will buy bonds. They won't go below negative 20 basis points. So think about that. European central banks are gonna buy bonds, government bonds, down to negative 20 basis points while we're thinking of raising interest rates. I, I just don't understand how that works, and that's why I think the Fed has a real tough problem. I saw in uh, February you interviewed Apple CEO Tim Cook and that you're also... You aren't, aren't going to criticize my watch. Tim, no, not yet. Not yet. You said you aren't going to buy one. Tim right? made fun of my watch. He asked me what my watch does and I said two things. Oh, this one actually does three things. It tells me the day, the time, and the day of the week. And Tim says, well, my watch will tell you 3,000 things. <laughs> It'll take you as many days to learn it probably. It may. Okay. Uh, him and uh, I understand the founder of Uber. Um, certainly innovative companies, entrepreneurial companies. In your conversations with them, what have they seen from an in entrepreneurial or an innovative side? Uh, is, is, the, is the landscape in their favor or are they just, it's not? Oh, they, they would both argue vehemently that the landscape is in their favor. Um, there are two companies in different places in their evolution. Although I will remind people, I'll remind you, and this is probably an interesting learning lesson, that in 1997, we did a bailout rescue finance for Apple. There's a couple shaking heads. And I made a big mistake. Or we, I'll, I'll, I won't take it personally. We made a big mistake. It, they had to pay a very high interest rate to borrow money. That's how risky of a credit Apple was in 1997. They were willing to give us equity in the company to buy down the interest rate. And we thought that was an unbelievably risky trade. That was a really bad, silly trade. Why would anyone take that stock? Stock traded down to two bucks. Um, in that period. J just so you know that you know, the world that you see today isn't the world it may be in a few years. So you know, Apple is a company that has evolved and evolved quite a bit. Um, you know, your students may not be old enough to remember the original Apple products, but when you go in the Apple office um, in California, they have the whole history of the Apple products from the you know, little brown cathode ray Apple tube to the little clam to the self-contained computers, um, some of those products didn't work very well. Uh, and Apple was literally trying to, at that point, compete with all of the um, computer manufacturers. And that was the point where Moore's Law was in its you know, infinite speed, where, where speed of computers and um, price of computers and speed of computing capacity was falling day by day. And there were companies like Dell and Gateway and all these other online order computers and have them made and delivered to your house. That was the beginning of online delivery too. We're just competing on a um, IBM operating system versus Apple that had its own operating system that none of us could figure out. I mean, so it seemed like it was a company trying to fix something that wasn't broken. Um, so that was the Apple back then. And then Apple's evolved itself four or five or six times um, and now, you know, we know Apple is the great computer company, great 
mobile handheld device, iPad company. It's, and you know the big question that Apple has is can it keep evolving? What's next, what's next, what's next? So we were just kidding about the iWatch. You know, okay, that's out. We know now, you know, literally in a week or two they're gonna ask, what's next? And you know, now they're talking about the twelve inch iPad and who knows what's what's in that evolution chain and you know, they'll talk about globalization. So, you know, that's a company that continues to evolve, but has enormous amount of competition around the world. Less than it had originally. The handset business is consolidated, but I'm sure there's plenty of people in this room that carry non-Apple products. And, and then they've got a Korean um, manufacturer with the, it's coming out with a brand new handset that's got enormous capacity as well and tech, great technology. So they're fighting for market share they're fighting to be a dominant player in their space, and they're in a different stage of evolution. Where Uber is really a disruptor. I mean, they are trying to be a global disruptor. They are taking a business model that exists, which has historically existed where you called up a radio controlled base somewhere in the world, and you booked a car or you asked a car to show up to a place, and they're trying to replace that with a mobile app that works everywhere in the world. So they're trying to do something completely. They're trying to be a big global disruptor. Um, and they're just trying to figure out how quickly can they grow. And with them, it's all about growing and outgrowing the competition. So their ability to execute is can I grow faster and make my competitor to the extent I have one obsolete? And it really is an economy of scale business. The more drivers I have, and the more people that are using my car, the less downtime my drivers have, the quicker I can get to pick you up, the less I have to charge you for the ride because my drivers are gonna earn more per hour if the car's occupied. So they have, in some respects, a big pricing algorithm. They're a big pricing algorithm business. Where Apple, on the other hand, is a big um, consumer product business. I mean, they're making something that you want to hold in your hand and you want to let everyone know you have and you want to look at your apps and things like that. So there are two really, really interesting companies at, at you know, different stages of their evolution. Notwithstanding where Apple is today, let's take the 1998 and Uber now, can you differentiate the risk, the definition of the type of risk that is, which is riskier, which wasn't, or why there is a difference in the risk? Well, there's risk in both of them. It's different risk. Um, you know, Apple has clearly established itself as a world-renowned brand. Mm. I'm sure, I haven't looked, but I'm sure if you go to the world-renowned brand survey, it's got to be a top 10 brand. Yeah. Got to be up there. I, I, I'd be willing to say it's a top five. You know, just the logo. We all know what the Apple logo is. You know, it's got to be up there with Coca-Cola, which is one of them. But McDonald's, Coca-Cola, Apple, I could probably name the top, you could probably name the top five. Um, it's a world established brand. Um, so they start with that incumbency of the world knowing who they are, what they are. They start with the mentality that we accept their products as being good. Um, so they just need to execute on keeping to create products that you and I will use and you and I will pay for. And that's the whole laboratory. And you know they, they're putting as much money into R&D as they need to, and they can put an unlimited amount in. Their daily cash flow is just extraordinary. I mean, I think in their earnings today, they had close to $200 billion of cash on the balance sheet. They're gonna buy back $150 billion of stock this year. And they're gonna do that out of, out of cash flow, the company. Uber, on the other hand, they're burning through cash every day. This is a company that is not making money today. They could make money today, but they're choosing, and I think rightfully so, to spend money to create brand loyalty and market share. So completely different mentality, where I think Apple has almost unlimited pricing power. Uber feels like they've got to create brand loyalty, they've got to create brand recognition, they have to create reliability, they have to own the drivers, they have to own the, the clients, and if they have to do that and lose money, they think that's a good, good long-term investment, has an infinite return on investment. And so far, the providers of capital have felt that to be true. 
So in the last three years, they've gone from raising money at almost zero to their last round publicly available data says it's around $42 billion. So they've been able to raise money from zero to $42 billion of valuation on a company that doesn't yet have profitability. Um, thank you. I think it's important our students understand the difference in the risk of one that's making money and one that's still losing money, but it, it, there, there's a purpose for that. Uh, back well, to the well, You know, the new textbooks are going to have to write about companies that never uh, make money but have a lot of market cap. Yeah. Well, yeah. that, we can yeah. start with Amazon. <laughs> I think Amazon had a, had a really strange quarter last quarter. They actually made money for the first time ever. I don't know if they'll ever do that again, but we'll see. You want to break the mold there. <laughs> break uh, the mold. Based on your nine, looking back at the 1998, what that experience of how Goldman, whatever, did not participate, what, what, what lesson could the students learn from that as you reflect back? There's infinite lessons to learn from any crisis or any tough situation. I'll call it a crisis. Why not? Um, you know, first of all, no matter what you do in life, no matter where you are, no matter what business you work for, if you work for yourself, nothing's ever a straight line. Um, and, and I tell this to kids all the time. I think the, 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 the single best career advice I can get, and I'm off tangent right now for a second, oh. but it's the same thing. The single best career advice I can give to your generation, and I own three in your generation, um, and they don't listen to me either, so it's okay if you don't listen to me. Uh, maybe I got a better shot with you guys. Is your generation has this unique desire to have to plot a course. And all of you seem to have to think you're good, know where you're going to be in one year, two year, three year, four year, five year, six year, seven year, eight year, nine year. And if you get off that course, you're all going to think you're failing miserably. It's virtually impossible for you to plot a course, and it's even more impossible for you to stay on that course. And if you do, you'll have a really unfulfilling life because you're not smart enough or good enough to plot a course that's going to get to you to where you want to go. And when I'm saying you'll, you'll be unhappy is because it's the twists in the road and it's the turns that are least suspected that are probably going to be the most interesting opportunities you'll ever get in your life. I never, ever thought I would work at Goldman Sachs. It was not, had I plotted my course at your age or any other age, Goldman Sachs would not have been on the, on the dot plot. When I went to Goldman Sachs, being chief operating officer and president or running a division would have never been on the dot plot until much later in my career. The day I went there, you know, I was going there to trade. I was going there, hey, they had a big balance sheet, they had a lot of capital, I can do this. But it wasn't like, hey, I'm going there to like do X, Y, and Z. Never would have been on my course. But when I talk to kids today, it, it's up. So back to your question. Number one, nothing in life is going to be in a straight line. Number two, you really understand people and organizations in times of adversity. Anyone can run Goldman Sachs when things are going well. In fact, it would be better if you don't run the place. The people are so good that they know exactly what to do on most of the days. So they don't need you to run the place. In fact, if you leave them alone, they do a better job. In those times of crisis, in those times of dislocation, people need to be led. They need to see that you're OK. They need to see that you're fine. They need to see that you're talking about the future, that you're not concerned that you're doing all the normal things that you would do in a normal period of time. So you have to do that. You have to show that you're in control. You have to show that you're having leadership. By the way, you can have doubts in your mind. You're only human to have doubts. But the people you're leading can't think you have doubts. Not for a second. Because if you have doubts, they're going to have doubts. You know, it, it's like you know, the CEO of my firm, Lloyd, says, you know, whenever you hit turbulence on the plane, just look at the stewardess's eye or the steward's eye. If they're fine and walking around doing their stuff, just relax. If they go run and get in their seatbelt, you got to worry. It's the same thing. You know, if, if, if everyone just thinks this is normal operating business, you do that. So, you know, you learn a lot about people in, in times of crisis. And I think the last thing you learn 
is that organizations and people are very malleable. You can get people and you can get organizations to do unbelievably spectacular things that you didn't think were anywhere on the radar scope. Again, not on that plot, but you know, when, when you need to move an organization and you need to adapt in a time of disconnect, you can do it. You can really do it. Um, and, and I've learned that at Goldman Sachs. I learned it, I think the first time I learned it, interestingly enough, I was talking about it yesterday. Richie might remember this. Um, April 27th, which was yesterday. Do you know what April 27th was, Richie? Do you remember it? No. Okay. April 27th, 1980, was it 86 or 87? I think it was 86. It was the day when the silver market went from $12 to $4 in two minutes. Uh, yeah, you wish, <laughs> you might have been, but you were picking up your daughter. <laughs> and it was, it was one of those market phenomena that had never happened before and chaos, pandemonium on the floor of the exchange. And it was sort of the first time in my career I was working for myself, running my own business, where I said, wow, there's a lot of issues here, a lot of problems here. Just stay focused, just stay concentrated, keep your people focused, and you'll be okay. And there were literally people that you know, didn't make it through the 24 hours, because you know, there was just so much chaos and dislocation that you just had to remind yourself that you know, just do what you're supposed to do and it will be okay. Um, you know, it's it, 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 it's, it's the, the, the thing that I tell people all the time, you know, bad things happen to good people. And it's okay, you know, and, and, and when something bad happens, it's not that the bad thing happened, it's how do you react to it, it's much more important. You should assume bad things are gonna happen. Bad things happen all the time, but just don't react, you know, in a crazy way. Don't make one bad thing a second bad thing and, 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 and work from there. So, you know, those are, are lessons that you learn. Uh, last thing I would say, and I know this is the second last thing I said, I, I already said last thing, uh, but this is equally as important. Nothing works better in a crisis and managing people and being a leader than communication. If you don't talk to people, they interpret the worst. So when you're out there talking to people, communicate, people, tell them what you're thinking, tell them what you think is going to happen, tell them you don't know, it's okay to tell them you don't know, tell them what you're working on, you know, people really understand that. At least they know that you're in control of the situation. And they'll actually be helpful to you. They'll say, hey, look, I know you said you think this and this might happen. Have you thought about that? And it's okay to say, no, I haven't thought about that. But you know what? Now I am thinking about that. What else didn't I think about? You know, communication in these times and, and drawing people into your circle is really, really important. And I think that's, you know, though that's important in times of non-crisis becomes 10 times more important in, in terms of crisis. Yeah, we can touch on the, the communication and not letting a crisis get you to become risk adverse yeah. to making the decision. <clears throat> um, somewhat of a leading question here. We have a number of uh, finance major undergraduates graduating in a few weeks here in the audience and a number of others who are just starting their finance. Is the financial services industry worth still worth going into as a career? And why? So, look. It's not a leading question. It's it's um, it's an interesting question. I think it's a. And first of all, I say this: the financial service industry is not for everyone. So one of the things I do, and I and I sort of love this day, is we bring in two thousand plus kids between their junior and senior year for a summer internship. It's a ten week interview for us, and it's a ten week interview for them. It's a real live interview. We work them like the regular employees at Goldman Sachs and they get into the trenches, they get involved in deals. But I get that group out the first week, and I speak to all of them in big groups, like four groups of 500. And the first thing I say to them, I say, look, for some of you, this will be the worst summer of your life. I don't know who, and I know every one of you thinks it's not you. And I know, but I said, trust me, there is some percentage of you in this room who are just gonna have a horrible summer. Don't think of it as a horrible summer. You will learn a lot about yourself. You will learn a lot about what you like and a lot about what you don't like. This will be the most informative summer of your life with what you wanna do with the rest of your life. And that is so valuable. 
at the stage you're at between your junior and senior year in, in college. Um, but it will teach you a lot about yourself. So you know, that's the first thing I'd say. The financial services world is not for everyone. But when you think of what the financial services world is, I talked about that transmission pipe. Do you want to be at the center of transmission? Do you want to be at the center of company expansion, job creation, providing capital, providing markets, advising on companies' M&A activity, advising wealthy individuals on how to maintain their wealth, how to invest their wealth, how to pass their wealth on from generation to generation. These are skills that if we're going to continue to grow economies around the world, and it doesn't matter what country you're in, these are basic skills that are going to be necessary for any country or any place to grow. We are the basic ingredient in economic growth and economic prosperity. For a company to grow, they need capital. We are the capital creators. We marry people with capital with people that need capital. We can do it in a variety of different ways. Figuring out what the best way is interesting. Private placement, public placement, shares, debt, common equity, preferred equity. You know, there's, there's hundreds of different silos that we're in. You know, how do you want to do that? What's the best advice? What's the best advice for the company? What's the best advice for the investor? How do you modulate between those two sides? You know, where you're literally in, in all, every thing we do, we've got two sides of the equation and we're always trying to balance the equation. You know, there's something unique and intriguing about coming up with an idea that XYZ, generic drug manufacturer, should buy this generic drug manufacturer. And you know what? Okay, they decide to buy it. Based on the takeover laws in some country, they need funds certain to bid for that con company. And you say, okay, I can give you $11 billion of funds certain. Go bid for that company. That happened last week. That was last week's trade. Now, when that company bid for another company, another company came in and bid for our company that we were representing. That's in, look, we had that on our board of possibilities. When you're sitting with that management team and says, okay, I bid for that company. What could happen? What could go wrong? We said, well, that company, is not going to like being smaller than you. He's, this is companies bigger than these two companies. These two companies merge. This guy's the small guy. So he ain't going to like that. He's just somehow going to try and break up this merger. We said, look, there's a 30 to 40% probability he tries to buy you or him. He tried to buy him. You know what? It's kind of fun, kind of interesting. But that's going to create a company that's going to sell generic drugs more efficiently and cheaper than the existing set right now. And if that's intriguing to you and that's interesting to you, that you want to be in the financial services. If it's not interesting to you, I get it. It's not interesting to any of my daughters. I couldn't interest them for anything to get involved in anything like that. So I completely understand it. Uh, one final question I want to ask. We, you and I discussed this briefly on the phone yesterday. Rich doesn't realize we have other, another thing in common uh, from the interview with, uh, what was it, uh, something, Business Insider. Uh, Rich, uh, well, before I say this, some of my faculty would say that the story I tell by myself is true. It should have been true and procrastinating. Uh, Gary's parents were told that he'd be lucky if he grew up to be a truck driver and should not go to college. Uh, my parents were told that I shouldn't go to college. I wasn't college material. Uh, Fourteen years later, I went back to become president of Seton Hall uh, with great delight, I might add, to vengeance is sweet. Uh, but I say that story because I want our students to understand they shouldn't be pigeonholed yeah. uh, and what opportunities they can have ahead of them if they think beyond that little pigeon. And we yeah. talked about it. So I was not the best student. Hmm. That was probably an overstatement. I was a bad student growing up. I was dyslexic. I was at that generation where they didn't understand what dyslexia was. So I was the dumb, lazy, smart-ass joker in the back corner kid who actually was working his butt off to try, to try and get D's. No one got it. I got it. My parents might have got it. My grandfather got it. You know, I, I owe sort of my existence in life to my grandfather who didn't give up on it. There's always got to be someone that looks out for you in life. 
Um, so when I said that comment, I, I was being honored by Teach for America and talking about the importance of good teaching. And I think Teach for America brings these young kids into classrooms and they do phenomenal work. Um, I was in probably third or fourth grade. I'm trying to think. I got thrown out of a lot of schools in the process, so I had to think where, what school I was in. I did end up at the good Catholic school. Nice Jewish kid, good Catholic school. Worked out perfectly. I lasted there longer than any other school. And they actually taught me more than any other school. That's a whole other story. Um, I think it was third or fourth grade where literally, you know, my parents came in for the conference. They, after the teacher in front of me, you know, told my parents how bad I was and what a bad student I was and everything. They asked me to step out of the room. Of course, the teacher tells my parents, you know, your son's an idiot, basically. He's, you know, never going to grow up to be anything. And, you know, my mom's sobbing her eyeballs out because my sisters were perfect students. Um, and, you know, my mom says, oh my God, what am I going to do? And the teacher says, you know, if he's lucky, he'll grow up to be a truck driver. And I heard that. I mean, I, I heard it, which was, um, in some respects, highly, highly motivational. You know, I wish I remember who that teacher was. I do know her name. I just don't know where she is today. Um, but it, 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 it was motivational to me. Like, I knew in my heart of hearts that I had what it took, and I wasn't going to fail. Failing was not an option, and I considered failing not an option. Um, my degree of success in her measurement scale of success was different. Like, I couldn't necessarily get the right answers on the exam, especially when she counted for spelling, because if you can't read, you can't spell. Um, so, you know, I, I couldn't do that well on her exams. But if she wanted to talk to me about anything she talked about in the classroom, because I could listen and hear and regurgitate it all back to her, I was willing to take her on. And I finally got into an academic environment um, much later on where you know, the, the academic community would allow me to prove myself in that manner. So, you know, and even in, 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 in college, it was different because you know, the, the nice thing about college, and I've said this to my kids and I'll say it to you guys, College is, the only thing college is about is time management. I think you go to college, you go to class 16 hours a week, something like that, right? Mm -hmm. Maybe 16 hours a week? Maybe. Maybe 16 hours a week. So you have 16 hours a week, you have to be somewhere. You've got to figure out how to manage the rest of the time. And I said, for, look, if I'm in class, you know, 16 hours a week at the most, I can figure out how to get my work done in the fashion that that college professor wants it done. I'll just figure this out because I've got, you know, literally six days a week. I'll go to, you know, if I work 16 hours a day, I got six days a week to figure out how to play in their system. And I played in their system in college and, and, and because it was a time management issue. So, you know, I, I proved to myself there that it, it could work. But, you know, had, had I not been able to do that, it would have just been a, a, a continued death spiral for, for me in, in many respects. And, and like I said, it, 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 it's, it comes down to you know, one or two people telling you that you're fine and believing in you, and then you believing in yourself. And, and I do believe you know, most of the success in your life will come from you believing in yourself. And it sounds like your story was you believed in yourself, I believed in myself, I was willing to make the mistakes. I started out the conversation saying, and I said this, I think, um, in Malcolm Gladwell's book or someone else, I am probably the world's best mistake maker. I really am, I'm really good at it. When you grew up the way I did, you were surprised when you got something right. You were used to getting it wrong. So you get very comfortable with making mistakes. Um, when you're six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years old, that's really hard. When you're my age, it's, it, it, it's a invaluable lesson to know how to make mistakes. And what you do not to make mistakes when you're my age is you never make a decision where you can make a mistake. So if I have to make a tough decision, I just call in 10 people that know as much or if not more than me and ask them all what they think. And I may let the 10 people fight it out. They come to a conclusion. They tell me what their conclusion is. And I go, okay, yeah, that sounds right. And that's mm -hmm. how you do it. I mean, literally, you know, you talked about managing the firm. I, I, there are very, very, very few decisions that I realistically make in the course of the year. The decision I make that's important is finding the people that know the most about the topic, getting them into a room, and listening to them argue back and forth. 
I have always said, you know, we've got five, five digits of extensions at Goldman Sachs. I said, you need to know nothing at Goldman Sachs except the right five digit extension. There is someone in this firm that is the world's leading expert on any question you can ask. And so, you know, I always figure I can get four or five of the world's leading experts in the room, yeah. listen to them argue, and usually they can come to a consensus. Yeah, well, and you started it in the midway there. You, you said there, there are points of awakening yeah. that may be negative, but certainly no one's going to challenge you. Not. Yes, I, you're right. You did. Uh, I went back 14 years later. The uh, director of admissions was still at the university. Oh, really? So it was wonderful to have that conversation. Did, 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 they, did they deny the first conversation? I didn't remember it. Didn't remember, yeah. I, but I did, and it made a difference. Yeah. It's okay. But, it worked yeah, for you. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I just want our students to realize that there should be no limitations on their dreams, that they really can pursue and should pursue and use their skills. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, I'll, I'll play a little trivia question with you. You guys are eliminated from this trivia question. Okay, Goldman Sachs, big recruiter. We go out and we recruit the most talented, most energetic, most highly achieving kids in the world. I, I'll, I won't bet, that's inappropriate. I bet you no one could name our number one or number two school that we recruit from in the United States. Anyone have a guess? Come on. Throw out a school name. Harvard. What was it? Harvard. Nope. That would be a good chance. Nope. Cooper Union. Nope. NYU. Nope. What was it? Penn. Nope. What was it? Fordham. Nope. Nope. Okay. I'm going to help you because you're never going to get it. West of the Mississippi. Nope. So I eliminated all the Ivies. I eliminated yeah. every East Coast school. What was it? Utah? Did I hear that? I heard University of Utah. You were very warm. There's one. Okay, BYU. BYU is number two. Oh, you haven't got number one yet. Go south. Now go south. <sighs> nope. I'll do this. Does this help? UT. UT1, BYU2. <laughs> no. No, because, Richie, I say that. It's important I say that because 90% of the people in this room, I thought they were thinking, they were thinking, they wouldn't answer it. They were thinking Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Penn. Right? They were thinking Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Penn. And by the way, 20 years ago, that would have, the Ivies would have encompassed probably 85% of our incoming analyst cost 20 years ago. Today, our, I mean, the, the, the BYU is really interesting for a different reason. But UT is, is very interesting too. You know, think of our world today. Our world, a third of our firm are technologists. A third of our firm never see a client. Over half of our firm is technology, operations people, um, finance people, you know, accounting people, things like that. So we've got to, you know, when, you, when you're hiring people like that, you've got to go to where those kids are. BYU, really interesting because all the kids are bilingual. They've all been on the Mormon mission. They're usually 23, 24, 25 years old. They're all bilingual. And it's, it's pretty interesting. So that's, that's good. There's a, there's a little catch to why BYU gets in there. Thank you. Well, Gary, I want to thank you very much for being with us today, for sharing your thoughts uh, with us. It really, I know your time is very uh, filled, so I, we're grateful for you being here. My, with my us. pleasure. It's a, it's a great opportunity. Thank you very here. much. Thank you. Thank you very much.